So, Rebecca, let's adjourn our private conversation about grief and complicated relationships. And let's start podcasting about grief and complicated relationships. You wanted to read a poem. Yeah. What's this poem? So I was in a workshop where there was time for writing and you were supposed to write on a certain subject and that's not what came out at all. Uh, a, a, a summary, I guess a eulogy to my mom came out hmm. and uh, I've read it to a couple people and they found it powerful. And then in the conversation that we were just having about some relationships are really complex and how do you grieve them? So it just seemed like the time. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, lay it on us. I've never read a poem. I've never... Okay, here we go. This time last year, my mother was saying yes to life. Cancer in seven places in her body. And I was left holding the bag. I think you're dying. I got a massage to try and relax. On the table, I had a vision that she would die on my birthday, December 25th. Instead, she falls on that day. Her 94-year-old lover cannot pick her up. She is hospitalized, fighting with the nurses, screams for her lover. Her doctor calls me. He and I agree to end her life. Palliative care, they call it. It takes a lot of paperwork to end someone else's existence. She spends one night in hospice. She dies December 29th. There ends my mother's life. Four husbands, stacks of credit cards. A life beginning in Chicago, the southwest side. Michigan for Teachers College, Colorado for an abusive marriage to a Jewish dentist race car driver. Back to Chicago, divorced, then to Milwaukee to try on being a mother, wife, and a PhD student in Irish literature. Then to San Francisco, divorced, then to Oakland, a homeowner with a philandering abusive partner. Then to San Diego, married again. Then to Seattle, divorced. Then to Florida, married. Then interned. A traditional Jewish burial in a non-traditional upside down concrete sarcophagus due to rising groundwater levels. Let her not float up. All her things dispersed now, 50 cashmere sweaters. I bring home seven boxes, artwork, poetry, books, clothes, bric-a-brac. I hold the last of her. Her sister and I talk once a week, try to be honest about who she really is or was. December 25th rolls around soon my first birthday without this very complicated woman, lover of men, poet, a lover of the arts, and somewhere deep in the distance, a mother. Wow. Yeah. Concise. So how does it feel to read it? Uh, it feels like the truest thing I've ever said about my mom. Yeah. What do you mean? Uh you know, a lot of... So when you... Having a narcissistic mother and <laughs> grieving a narcissistic mother for a year, people often say, like, oh, what are you missing about her? What were things that you did that were fun together? And I can think of, like, arts events that we went to together. Um, but there was really nothing fun about being with my mom. And I think this poem is really inspired. This thing came up on my... Instagram feed um, char characteristics of narcissistic people and the first one was um, is competitive with their child mm -hmm. and I watched that little first part of the clip over and over and over again and I just it like came back in a flood all of the times that she was competitive with me 
And then I started thinking about what it's like to parent E and not be competitive with them. And just the radical difference of what time looks like. So like when I spend time with my child, I'm sitting mostly listening to them 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. When my mom spent time with me, she talked nonstop about her. Mm. And that's like such a different you know, and then when you're parented by someone like that, your wiring is so screwed up because you're continually trying to like pull yourself in so that you don't get in trouble. And then, you know, I learned how to be endlessly emotionally available. Um, so in that poem, just hitting on her, what she did in her life and like, you know, I'm just one line. She tried on, I'm two lines, I guess. Well, sort of. I mean, you say she tried out being a mother or yeah. something, but there's nothing that you're not mentioned. Mm -hmm. Every move you were moving with her. Yeah. And, and that was not in the poem because that's not how it feels to you. Yeah. And then that last move where she moves to Florida, I don't, it's the first big move. I don't go with her. And I remember her saying, so Eli will come out and spend the summers with me and me saying, no, he won't. And that was like, I mean, we've talked about how do you not continue narcissistic patterns. That was me like, oh, this pattern of narcissistic abuse will not. No, you don't. You do not get my child alone. That is unsafe. Something horribly, yeah. something bad will happen. The only way I have to protect myself is to not come along with you. Mm -hmm. And so when people say like, why did you deny your child access to their grandmother? I'm like, do you want me to list off everything bad that happened in my childhood? <laughs> because yeah. she hasn't learned jack shit, and the chances that she will something will accidentally happen to Eli are too high. Right. So, in sh I shared it with some friends yesterday. Some like you know the people that have really. I mean, I can't believe it's been a year. Like that core group that's really been there for me this last year. I. You know, as we do now, <laughs> sent them a voice memo in a text, three minute voice memo, and just, you know, heard back a lot of things back about witnessing my pain and witnessing my growth for the last year and my relief in the last year, like as hard as the last year has been. Mm -hmm. There's been chaos from my mother, but it's been predictable as opposed to when she was alive. It was completely unpredictable hmm. there's also the fact that she would never evacuate in hurricanes and so there's tremendous relief when a hurricane now goes through florida and i don't even have to think about who or you know I, I wish safety on all those people but like the idea that my mother never evacuated in 15 years <laughs> yeah i mean it's we're, we're coming up on a year anniversary and the jewish tradition that's called a yort site and i'll i'll light a candle um but it's, you know, it's coming up hard. I'm listening to a lot of the band. Mm -hmm. I saw that. That album is so good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, we were talking earlier about how I went to Jerry Saltzman's memorial recently. For those who don't remember the episode, I worked with Jerry as a colleague closely I, for many, many years. And I did too. Yeah. yeah. For a good span of time years really our department the couple and family therapy program was just me and jerry and paul mm. you have to work very closely and often when there's just three of you and you have 130 students to take care of all the decisions that have to be decided upon within a program that's one thing that really surprised me about being a professor is that 99 or not 99 but 90 percent of my job was administrative. had nothing to do with yeah. teaching and yeah. had everything to do with running a business essentially yeah. and and managing an ever-changing group of folks who are doing something really intense yeah right yeah it's not teaching accounting it's <laughs> uh, release you know training people to be competent enough to start actually treating clients within a year of entering yeah. the program and it's crazy and then all the stuff that happened there so you know i, I knew Jerry very well and worked alongside of him, you know, for a long time. And we really depended on each other. And when he died suddenly, it was a huge shock. And, the, you know, the memorial 
was interesting because, you know, people are crying and it hadn't really hit me yet. And one of the interesting things that they did at the memorial was instead of having people come up, you know how they usually mm -hmm. pass the mic around or something? The uh, leader uh, made this decision, which I kind of enjoyed, but you miss out on something. He said, let's do a relaxation exercise. And then mm -hmm. I want you to think about a story that you want to share. And then I want you to pair up with someone mm -hmm. in the audience and, and share it there. And it saved a lot of time, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you miss out on hearing some of the more spontaneous stories. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like pros and cons, but, but I think they knew with Jerry, he would have been there till midnight. Right. That's what he was saying. Um, and I really, I felt quite honored that I was even, even invited because it, you know, it was their main memorial. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like a, an Antioch memorial that, mm -hmm. that that's later. And I was also in the short slideshow, you know, because mm -hmm. I just figured Jerry and all of his travels, he would have a lot more people that are in the inner circle than B, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? <laughs> and so it, it felt, and you know, when I posted the episode in which I replayed the interview with Jerry, a lot of people at the memorial had heard it, mm -hmm. family members, you know, his sisters, his daughters, others, and all of them were like coming up to me individually mm -hmm. and saying that they really enjoyed that. And I imagine that would be true to, you know, some people will save voicemails mm -hmm. from loved ones after they pass and hearing the voicemail or hearing the recording, it's so powerful. And to have a, a, an hour long interview in which I interviewed him about his, his whole life, you know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, and the, his childhood, the pros and the abuse that he went through. And, but what hit me was, and we sang a bunch of songs uh, throughout the service. Oh. Started with Morning is Broken, which is mm -hmm. one of my favorite songs, and ended with Here Comes the Sun. Mm -hmm. And that's when it hit me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I thought, uh, you know, we're singing this happy song, and I'm like, I, I just completely lost it. And mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure no one else was except for me. And I'm a little tall, and I was standing in the aisle. <laughs> so it was, I was trying, I just, I didn't want to, I, I, I don't know, I just didn't want to bother anybody with my. And, you know, of course, crying is healthy, but... Well, I'm remembering a memorial I went to that was supposed to be very happy, and I was just in the corner sobbing. Like, you know, we all have different yeah. reactions. Yeah, and, and I'm not saying that anyone w would have shamed me or any anything. I, I don't know. It just, it just felt out of sync with mm -hmm. the room, I guess, <laughs> in a weird way. But, but it felt good to, to have that. It would have felt weird not to have it at the memorial. And... Um, you know, it was interesting. And, uh, and then I learned about other things, which I will probably talk about at some point, other, um, developments of loss and grief that are very significant to me in my life. And, uh, yeah. So thanks for sharing your poem. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's always a good poem when I can when it sticks with you and there's mm -hmm. a number of moments in the poem that's that stick with me you know that are felt and understandable and and relatable and visual i guess there's like a there's a it's easy to visualize the mm -hmm. the the poem and i said concise because it's so it's you packing a lot of shit in there you know <laughs> talking, we're talking what is it 82 years and <laughs> but you could write a whole book on what you are referring yes. to, you know, yeah. like you're, you're, you're packing it all in. And since I know at least some of the story and the emotion, then I, I'm like, oh yeah, okay. You know? Yeah. I mean, reading it to you and thinking about it now, I'm just thinking about this young kid getting dragged all around. Yeah. And that's what I really felt when I was writing it. Like, oh, we're going here now and we're partnered or not partnered. You know, I mean, it, when you're a child of, a divorced mother, whether or not your mother is partnered, impacts so many things. If she's happy or unhappy, safe or unsafe, if there's enough money or not enough money. Um, and so, you know, each one of those moves is, is full of all that, all those dichotomies. Mm -hmm. um, you moved to Seattle because of her? Yeah. When? 1986 or 87 she actually oh. left me it was 87 the summer of 87 she had lost her job at the san diego opera and she was again not, didn't have work and she was working freelance and her very famous friend art skolnick who's one of the people that saved pike place market um invited her up here for a job 
I hope he's deceased. His ex-wife is Pepper Schwartz. This story gets more complicated. <laughs> this job, he, it was basically some kind of weird land scam thing. So she got up here and it wasn't really a job. So this is classically my mom. She, she leaves me in San Diego for three months with this nudist yoga instructor. <laughs> I know, the whole thing is so bizarre. Um, and so I basically raised myself for three months. I was... I didn't have a mom anymore, and I'm like 16, maybe. And then I. You'd already grown up fast, though. Yeah. Although I don't have a driver's license, which makes things very complicated because my mom could never get it together, teach me how to drive. Hmm. And so I think I went to Israel that summer. Somehow I go to Israel, I come back, and I move to Seattle to be with my mom, who's gotten this job for what turns out to be some crazy land scam thing. And she, once again, is unemployed pretty quickly. and working freelance again and the bill collectors are coming like this is like the whole story what high school did you go to <sighs> I, I, what's that face oh god Tough. only a few what, of your it? listeners will understand what i'm about to say next but if i say this to a seattle person they're like oh god uh i went to the bush school my senior year of high school i'm not familiar yeah uh, there's that's so like Lakeside Bush, yeah. yeah. I know Lakeside. Yeah. So, so these are extremely prestigious private schools. Yeah, but by the time you get to your senior year, like Bill Gates went to Lakeside. Yeah, and never went to college, just went to Lakeside and yeah. rewrote all of their computer programs. So all of these kids had been together since kindergarten, and I show up my senior year, and it was just socially, it was just brutal. Like no one would talk to me. I ended up dating someone, and it was it was super complicated. Were they super privileged and a yeah. a hole lish? <laughs> yeah, I mean their house was so big. Your your oh your, your the person I was dating. I I mean yeah, one of those houses on Capitol Hill that's like the size of ten houses. Oh yeah, and like everybody lived in houses by like 15th that. Fifteenth and yeah. by Volunteer Park. Yeah, yeah, and then I was living with a single mom who's like work not working working i don't have a driver's license i don't have a car you know i am so out of these kids norms my mother is dating this abusive guy who ends up in jail at some point we had she had to borrow money from my boyfriend to like get him out of jail i mean it was just like so you graduate and then you go to evergreen yeah which okay. is probably the best thing that ever happened to me yeah, because yeah. like then i'm back with people who are like me again yeah, right but if I tell anyone in Seattle I went to Bush for a year, they're always like, you? What? Doesn't make any sense. And um, the people from Bush, who are all very nice, but like, anyways, they'll say to me, like, why don't you come to any of the reunions? And it's like, why would I come? Yeah. <laughs> you had an opportunity to be nice to me, and you were not. <laughs> I was the stranger. Welcome the stranger. And it's a small school. It's small. There were like yeah. 50 of us at that point. In the whole school. No, no, no. In the in the graduating class. Oh, okay. And also academically, I you know I should have gone to Garfield. Like I was, I'm not strong writer. Why did your mom? It's expensive. Yeah, because she had this fantasy about who we were and who she wanted to raise. And again, it was her fantasy of who we were. So you mentioned Pepper Swartz. Yeah. Did you know her in yeah. real life? Yeah, I knew Pepper Schwartz. So for people who don't know, that so there, there's the a- The term lesbian de bed death was invented by Pepper Schwartz. Yeah? Yeah, here in Seattle. Okay. She is a sociology famous, professor. Famous, famous, famous. Here I think it's sociology, yeah. And she is known for a lot of things from behind the scenes, because I, I know people who work with her, and I won't out them. But let's just say there's not a lot of positive things being said by people and the only way that i know her is because she was on the reality tv show called married at first sight mm -hmm. she is one of the so-called experts who choose to match two random people together mm -hmm. before they've ever met mm -hmm. to get married so that the show premise is you know a number of people apply mm -hmm. the experts interview all these folks they'll go to their home and they'll film all this stuff and then the team gets together and says, okay, let's let's match these two to get married because we think that's going to work out or whatever. And newsflash, it doesn't usually work out. <laughs> and also, uh, Pepper, so the team is Pepper Swartz, who's a sociology professor, which is mm -hmm. not psychology mm -hmm. or marriage and family therapy, 
but arguably a scientist that's related to humans on some level. Then you have a pastor, and then you have at least the season that I watched, or the seasons that I watched, a doctoral level marriage and family therapist like like mm. myself. And the system they would be using looked completely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I did a whole deep dive on matchmaking science and how bad it is, mm -hmm. meaning that, you know, long story short, the consensus is that there's no way that a human being or a system would be able to predict if two people are going to be attracted to each other and stay together in the mm -hmm. long term. We, we've come at it from so many different angles, mm -hmm. from psychometrics to interviews to attachment style to culture. You know, there's all sorts of things that we have done. Because, you know, imagine if you had that tool mm -hmm. to be able to predict if two people, you know, you'd save a lot of people time and, and heartache and annoyance and trauma. And there's been a lot of businesses that have claimed that they've had that science, but lo and behold, people are still struggling with online dating, <laughs> you know, because of that. But anyway, so Pepper Swartz and the others are saying that they have a system that is based on science that they don't share with us. That's always mm -hmm. the thing. They're always like, we have a system, you know, where we have surveys and we figure it out, personality was. And then they show us a glimpse of it on the show and it just looks completely arbitrary. Like Pepper Swartz will go into one of the candidates' houses and observe like very briefly, you know, just based on her own cultural lens, like, well, this guy is kind of clean, but he's also kind of a slob, whatever. And, you know, this, this woman has a lot of feminine things, you know, and then later on, they get together and half of the reason why they match people up has to do with their cultural viewing of mm. someone's uh, decor on the inside. Mm -hmm. And these are young people, they're in their 20s. So, you know, so it's not like necessarily have the time or the funds to decorate the way that, you know, you, and when I was in my 20s, it was just shit that right. was just like given to me. plastic boxes and... <laughs> yeah, it was just like hand-me-downs. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you have a couch? Thank you. I'll, you know, it's been out in the rain a couple, I don't care. It's something, like, it's something I can sit on, give it to me. It's not like a choice of decor. It was just like, I'm poor, give me that, give me that couch. Anyway, so uh, anyway, that, that's my experience at Pepper Swartz. And what is your experience? So I had a couple Thanksgivings or other kind of family dinners with Pepper Schwartz and her family, Art Skolnick. And so this is back then? This is, yeah, I'm like 16, 17, 18. Um, you know, I mean, even then it was like the Pepper show. Like, I mean, I, I bet she has no memory of me or who I am. Um, uh, it was very much the Pepper show. It was very, everything is like gorgeous and ostentatious. Not ostentatious, but like that like Northwest, perfectly cozy and you're kind of invited to the Pepper Schwartz show. Hmm. But she doesn't know you or, yeah. And your mom was trying to ingratiate or something? Yeah, I mean, you know, those of us who have single moms, <laughs> if you move around a lot, holidays are incredibly complicated. You don't have family around. You can't afford to go somewhere. Someone's got to invite you over. And you're always, you know, I mean, I can tell you, countless Christmases of being invited somewhere and they're like, uh, here's a box of pencils. Like, you know, you know, there's not really room for you, but people know your story is sad and make room at the Man, table that's, for you. That's worse than just staying home. Oh, yeah. Because one, you're enduring ridiculousness, but also you're observing everyone else have a good time. Yeah. And maybe other kids your age who are loved and paid attention to and understood. And then you walk in and you're just like, um, I'm glad now that I'm seeing what I'm missing. But I lived it so much that it's like, you know, when you grow up in a traumatic household, you very quickly switch into like, oh, this is, you know, just smile and take the food and you'll be home watching something on TV that is comforting soon enough. So mm -hmm. just grin and bear it. But the idea that like holidays are fun and times with family and family tradition, like I don't have that. Yeah. Because if you listen to that story, you know, we're moving every four years. Um, and she has narcissistic personality and is unable to really bond. And this Art Skolnick story, you know, their parents, I think Art Skolnick's parents introduced my grandparents to each other. So, like, this is, you know, multi-generations of friendship. And it's really interesting to me that she can maintain that relationship because there's so much history. But, you know, her friendships were very limited. Oh, well, happy holidays, everyone. How, how does it feel to go down this memory lane? It's super interesting. I mean, you know, knowing Pepper Schwartz is a, there are a couple of Seattle names that like stop people like you, you knew Pepper Schwartz. So, 
uh, yeah, it's kind of, it's interesting. I mean, I don't think about those times a lot. But I do think about Art Skolnick and how he's the reason I'm in Seattle. Yeah, I didn't um, know that it, it was that uh, story. I don't think I knew that chapter. I, I think I always figured you came to Olympia to go to Evergreen. Oh, mm-hmm. And then you just went a little north and ended up in Seattle. Mm-hmm. But you wouldn't be here if your mom hadn't randomly moved up here in, yeah. in 1986 or whatever. 87. Yeah, all the way from San Diego, too. Like, really... I mean, it was a brand new world for me. I remember I was in shorts. Have I told you this story? Mm-mm. I didn't own any pants. <laughs> I owned like maybe like two pairs of like really thin cotton pants. And I'm going to the Bush School where people own lots of pants. And people are, this one guy turns to me at some point and says, when are you going to stop wearing shorts? Weren't you, weren't you freezing? I don't even remember. Um, but I remember going home and being like mom I, I think i need pants and i had like one cotton jacket and you know i just remember being like soaked and and there's a thing here that happens here where like your jacket gets wet and then because it's not really warm inside then it gets moldy like there's just the smell before the gore-tex before everybody had the fancy patagonia you know there's just like occasionally i'll still smell it like that kind of moldy yeah. wet cotton that like was my teenage years. Um, yeah, so I was completely unprepared to, and my mom <laughs> is narcissistic and like doesn't prepare me, right? So it takes some kid who's probably well-parented and wealthy to look at me and be like, girl, you need pants. Let's work on the pants problem. Yeah, my God, I hadn't even thought about that. Of course, yeah, a, a mother that has her kid leave the house in September and maybe October, and it's not, warm in seattle i mean warmest is 75 or something but it can get down to 50 40 around those times and to have a mother that doesn't or a parent that doesn't notice that and then you have to think huh wait so some random kid notices your needs before you and your mom do yeah wow it's like i've got something to tell you (laughs) You're not going to be able to wear shorts yeah. all year here in Seattle. Yeah. And that's such a funny phrase. Mom, I need pants. <laughs> yeah. Uh, th- th- anyone born and raised in Seattle has never <laughs> had to ask their parents for pants. Yes. We, we, we plenty, plenty, plenty of pants. Yeah. It's the opposite. It'd be right. like summertime and you go to the beach with like <laughs> jeans, jeans rolled up. Yeah. And, and you're just like, mom, I think I need shorts. <laughs> you know? Um, well, let's take a break. When we get back, let's do some emails. What do you say? Okay. All right, let's do an OPP, an old patron praise for people that became patrons all the way back in 2021. We have middle tier patrons, Ramon from the Netherlands, Be- uh, Ber- Ber- Berlin from Utah, Berlin from Utah, Lisa from Palm Springs, California. Nice. Have you been to Palm Springs? I mean, it's the gay capital of the Western Americas. Yeah. I, I hear it's wonderful, and it's, I... I've never been? I've never been. Oh, we should go to the Trixie... You, you should book all of the podcasters at the Trixie Motel, and we oh. should podcast from the Trixie Motel. Let's do it. Jill from Santa Rosa, California. Rachel from... That's actually... I'm flying into that airport next week. Oh. Rachel from Minnesota, and Anna from God knows where. And the <laughs> following people are just regular patrons. We have Helena from Sweden, Donna from Albuquerque, Kana, Kana from Arkansas, Carolina from Ontario, Jamie. A lot of names, of people who have names of places that live other places. It's, oh yeah, Carolina, Helena, Jamie. I'm sure there's a Jamie somewhere. <laughs> Jamie from Ashland, Oregon. Isn't Ashland, Oregon where the... It's the Shakespeare, the Shakespeare the thing, Oregon yeah. Shakespeare Festival. It's fantastic. Jennifer from Austin. Julian from Austin. We love Su- Austin. Susanna from Austin. We love Austin. I just realized this is uh, alphabetized oh, okay. <laughs> by, by city. <laughs> Amanda from Boston Spa, New York. Boston Spa. Uh, Luna from Barcelona, Spain. Barth. Barcelona. Bori from Berlin, Germany. Alice from Brighton, Great Britain. Megan from Brighton, Massachusetts. <laughs> Kimberly from Brooklyn, New York. Claire from Brooklyn. Olivia from Bucharest, Romania. Bucharest. Jason from Burien, Washington. We always call Burien the Bucharest of Seattle. <laughs> 
Jennifer from Burlington, New Jersey. Nora from Chicago, Illinois. Carly That's from- That's my people. Carly from- Just mentioned in my poem. Columbus, Ohio. Lila from Dallas, Texas. David from Dublin, Ireland. Paige from Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania. Alex from Eugene, Oregon. Um, sorry, Eugene, for your college football team. Mm, going down for <laughs> once. I mean, the Ducks have been on top for decades. Uh, there was a string there where they dominated the Huskies, but we have won most of the past number of matches, which is a very important thing to me and my friends. And we haven't talked about watching the Apple Cup together and then going to see sushi and sumo wrestling together. You're right. Uh, Taylor from Everett, Washington. Ola from Poland. Oh, my people. Lilith from Gainesville, Georgia. Tom from Galway, Ireland, Alex from Glendale, California, and Tony from Hornchurch, Great Britain. Thank you so much for becoming a patron all the way back then and staying a patron this whole time. It's amazing. So you sent me a link to this. I probably have sent it to you the last three years. You finally said yes. No, I don't. I, I really? don't think. Yeah. I, I've never heard of sumo matches being outside of Japan. In fact, I, I told friends of mine, uh, one friend who lived in Japan for 15 years, and he was like, they have sumo outside of Japan? That's weird. And you sent me this link, and I was like, hell yeah. So we bought the tickets a long time ago. And the thing with the college football is that they're so oriented towards money these days that they don't actually make the schedule until closer to game day because they're trying to optimize advertisements mm. on TV. But anyway, I did, you know, Apple Cup is this really big deal between the two state schools in Washington State. So on one hand, I'm thinking, well, my team, the Huskies, should be dominating. And by the time we go to sumo... So you say to me, by the time we meet up, the game will be in the clear, no problem. Yeah. That's not what happens at all. No. <laughs> and I, I either thought or said, but you never know with the Apple Cup because <laughs> when the Huskies are doing well... We will sometimes lose the apricot when wazoo is doing well sometimes they will lose to us there's this weird paradox of the apple cup and it was looking like it was going to happen again but in the last seconds we kicked a field goal and won and we were uh in the restaurant and i was watching you anyway, know I, I purposely so, picked a place so we could watch but the game. we're close but at one point you're like okay we need to go so like Everybody gets up to go, and we're all lined up, and you're like, we can't go! So we're all standing for the end of the game. Yeah. And uh, it was very funny. In front of us, there was a house divided. There was a family of... Mostly cougars, actually. <laughs> I, know, I think there was one husky. I think it was like eight cougars. Yeah, so so us, or I guess me being maybe the only husky fan among us, I'm watching over the shoulders of all these cougar fans, and I, you know... I'm cheering, and then I look. I didn't notice until mm -hmm. after the game had ended. I looked down, and you know, just two feet in front of me, and there's this you know big table of all these cougars who are crestfallen. But anyway, we go to sumo, and it was amazing. It was so visually gorgeous. Yeah. So it's the space that can be anything. I've seen the XX there. I've seen tons of shows there. Mm -hmm. But the way they had done it, where it's like. The arena is in the middle, taiko drummers all along the back wall. Mm -hmm. It's packed tight. Where it's like we are on each other. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so we're really close and yeah. can see the sumo happening very close to us, which was really special. And they also make it kind of an entertainment comedy thing. <laughs> what did you think about the constant hetero jokes? It was I was expecting no nothing less yeah. there were two very great butch femme couples right down from us and i was thinking here we are in the heterosexual world um but i learned more sumo history i mean i just the whole martial arts history the whole much how much it's revered in japan and how they are the only people outside of the family who are invited to emperor's funerals and mm -hmm. Just the history and the importance in Japanese culture. Like, I kind of knew it, but I thought they taught it to us beautifully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know who I was talking to, but I mentioned sumo, and they said it was a, an, a white American person, and they said something like, so is that kind of like WWE or mm -hmm. something? Like, you know, a WrestleMania? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no. <laughs> sumo is... Uh, quite possibly the most serious sport you'll ever come across. Mm -hmm. It's highly ceremonialized. 
There's all these unspoken rules that he went over a little bit. It goes back hundreds of years. It's it's a very important... It's a lifestyle. I mean, yeah. you live it. You live in a stable. You live in other people who are being trained in your method, and there's no off-season. You're right. in that lifestyle 24-7, 365 days a year. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was really cool to see. And you were really touched. I mean, I can't think of something we've done before that so much represented your culture. Hmm. And it was great to do that w- with you. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think of it similar as when you went to my kid's bar mitzvah. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, here is something that is really old from my world. Mm -hmm. How old is it? How old is bar bar and bat mitzvahs? Yeah. Uh, The beginning of time. It is is how you train a young adult to be part of the community. I mean, I think, you know, it's equivalent to a walkabout or anything of an agrarian-based society, how you... Yeah, it was, it was, it was cool. So, email, yeah. middle tier patron Sarah from the South. She says, on social media, I shared a side-by-side image of my baby's third ultrasound along with an image of him. I sent you this email a oh. while back. It, it relates oh. to things that you've been through. Okay. Because this picture of her baby has been co-opted oh, by... Shit anti-abortionists so anyway on social media uh, sarah she says i i shared a side-by-side image of my baby's third ultrasound along with an image of him a few weeks old because the likeness was uncanny yahoo news wrote up a little fluff piece on it i gave them a few quotes and they used our names and a few more pics it was a it was fun for a day then everyone forgot about it a few months later the image started popping up everywhere with strong pro-life and political rhetoric that I do not support. Mm -hmm. I found out a national pro-life organization had published it in their newsletter along with our full names and the quotes that I gave to Yahoo as if I had given them an interview and my support. It snowballed from there. It's five years later, and it oh. and it still keeps popping up with hundreds of thousands of shares across all plot, platforms every time some new activist shares it. I feel angry, guilty, and sad. Hmm. I try to ignore it, but it's like I can't ex- I can't ex- escape it. Mm-hmm. Every time someone's grandma's cousin, every every time someone's grandma's cousin shares it, I get tagged in it. It's a struggle to avoid arguing in the comments. Some people will take it down if I ask, but most don't. Mm -hmm. Everyone else tells me it's my fault for putting it online in the first place. And I get that. uh, And I get that. And now I know better. Mm. That's what she says. And now my kid is reading and starting to enjoy looking things up online with supervision. But it occurred to me that this is what he's going to see when he thinks to Google his own name. Mm -hmm. How will I apologize to him for getting his face at the center of a zillion of these nasty arguments online, especially with the reversal of Roe v. Wade? Rebecca, what do you think? I mean, I, first off, I'm so sorry. You know, I think with the way that technology is working, there is no way for us to predict where things will end up these days. And I've also heard this a lot. A lot of people are no longer sharing their kids' pictures um, because of this same thing. Anyone can take it. Um, And I, you know, I have the same story of, you know, how do you get something taken down on the internet? You don't. Um, So I just want to say that your stress is real. um, And it is completely overwhelming you know, I mean, I think what I, what I had to do with my experience was give it back to the artists that made those choices to photograph me in those ways um, and know that that is my image, but it's not my story. I mean, I would say, you know, I can't tell this woman what's going to help, but um, to know that this is the anti-abortions version of her story. It has nothing to do with what her story really is, even though it's very hurtful. I mean, this is like a meditation practice that I have to do. I, this story is really different than mine. It sounds like it's, you know, 10 million times more hits than what was done to me. Well, and names are... Yeah, full names. And That's terrifying. the way that it's framed, As she if, is yeah. pro-life. Right. 
and against abortion. You know, yeah. like she's their their poster child, uh, literally. And I would ask, like, has she contacted? She must have already contacted the lawyer. But this stuff is impossible. I mean, yeah. there's no. Well, but maybe she hasn't, and that is absolutely something you do. Yeah, and I mean, get a lawyer to write up a cease and desist letter right. for sure. If you contact them and they don't, you say, oh, I have a cease and desist letter right here. Yeah, it, it, asking politely mm-hmm. will get you the results that you mentioned, Sarah, in that some people will take it down, but most won't. You send them a legal document of some sort, you're probably going to get more people reacting <laughs> more quick. So, uh, you know, maybe that would help. I don't know. But the thing that I'll say is you say that people tell you that it's your fault for putting it online in the first place and you say that you get that. I don't get that. I think now we've finally realized that bad actors will do this kind of thing. But, you know, 99.9% of parents were and still are to some extent putting this stuff online all the time. And you wouldn't think that this would happen to anybody, right? And it's not okay that an organization decides to use you in this way. You know, there's so many other things they could be doing, right? They, they could find... Make up your own content, yeah, people. They, they could find their own uh, poster child who actually wants to be a part of this or something. But of course, the child wouldn't have consent. Um, they could have anonymized it. They could have not mentioned your name mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it, it, because they didn't ask you for permission. There, there's a lot of things that they could have done that we think that are probably ethical and and potentially even legal. Well, and she asked, what do I say to my kid? And I think I would say, honey, I'm really sorry. And I would just take them through the whole thing as in an age appropriate way for them to understand how the internet works. Here was the super cute picture that we have of, me, of you at these two different ages. We loved you so much and we wanted to share it. And we put it out into the world and then we thought it was fun. A, a news agency that we trusted wanted to do a little bit more story. And so, you know, we used our full names with them. And then people who we didn't know and didn't trust got a hold of it. And, and we're so sorry that we can't control what happens next. Um, but we love you very much and we're going to do whatever we can to protect you. You know, I mean, just I, I think to, to, to talk a kid through appropriately how the Internet works is really important because mm-hmm. they don't understand. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've, there's yeah. a c- case going on right now in my practice where um, a teenage girl is getting consistently harassed by another teenage girl online and Every time I get an update, I'm like, why does the harasser's parents still give that girl a phone or have access to social media? (laughs) Like, you know, I mean, we have no ability to conceptualize how this stuff works and impacts people. There's been larger shifts in our culture about how information has is shared than ever before. And we are decades behind in being able to control it yeah and maybe another thing to say once the kid is old enough is to say you know if anyone ever says anything to you about it then here's three things that you can say (laughs) anyway let's take a break we get back another email what do you say okay All right, back from the break. So, Anonymous Patron, she says, Your podcast is an invaluable resource, and I want to thank you. I have been going through a divorce for the last three years. My ex has dragged out the process and continues to file motions on contempt charges against me. So, just trying to be in here. You know, this happens a lot, and I've worked with a lot of clients and people in my personal life who have been through this, where there's just, a, a, you know, their former partner is just determined to drag it out and to involve lawyers constantly and to oppose every single um, offer of a compromise. You know, there's there's just this, it's, it's, it can be really awful. So it sounds like an MS patron is going through that. It has been a very stressful and expensive experience and there is no end to it. My question is, can you possibly offer some advice for me on how to get through this? Hmm. I feel so scared that I will be bankrupted Mm -hmm. and the accusations are brutal and false. Mm -hmm. Rebecca. Yeah. uh, It's a slog. Um, Pace yourself. Really get a great, I have a friend going through this right now and man, she is just devastated by it. Um, 
And so as much support as you can find, really gather your true people around you so that you are not alone in being devalued like this by someone that you love so much. Um, and know that a certain type of person, this won't stop, especially if there's kids involved. I've seen cases like this go on and on and on. Mm. Um, and I've seen some people, I don't want to say give up, but kind of let the other side win just for mm -hmm. the money yeah. drained. And because that's a whole other form of abuse mm -hmm. to leave you bankrupt after this situation. Um, so I, I know this sounds naive, but really pick your battles, mm -hmm. uh, save your energy, f spend as much time as you can. This friend that's going through it, I took her out to dinner and a show. I was just like, <laughs> She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, you're going through hell. Like, let me do something nice for you. Yeah. Um, so make sure that the people that are around you know that you need constant care uh, because it's this is, a, this is emotional abuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is the worst kind of abuse out there. Yeah. Yeah. The things that I wrote down are similar to what you're saying. Support, support, support for potentially daily venting might mm -hmm. be necessary. The second thing is to work with your ex as best as you can. Uh, uh, I don't know your approach on I'm a patron, but there's a Venn diagram between what is right and what is going to work. And sometimes what is right and what is going to work is within the same area of the Venn diagram. It's sometimes not. So even though you might be right and it might be justified to fight or to nitpick on this issue or something, it might actually make everything worse. It's it's just one of those things. And it sucks that one would have to give in, but sometimes that's... Your, your sanity is worth it. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you just have to say, look, I, I'm being screwed, but the faster we can get to this being resolved it is actually a win for me overall. Right. I mean, I think about this in a couple of different things I'm helping people with. Like, th there is a financial price... How do I describe this? Um, you know, sometimes you don't get justice, quote, or get to, quote, win, but you get your mental health back. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another point that I would find through experiencing this as a therapist that I would eventually tell everyone as they went into this that there is no path to justice through this contentious. Through the legal system. No. Yeah. <laughs> you, lawyers and society and your friends might even tell you that you deserve justice and that this is wrong, that your ex is doing this. And that mindset will screw you because mm -hmm. there's there's no path. You know, If your ex is determined to make things miserable in most circumstances, at the end of, of all the possible roads, none of those roads will you, will you be telling yourself that fairness and justice occurred. Mm -hmm. it, it just will not happen. And, and so letting go of that is a big part of it. The other thing is potentially to avoid or manage the other person psychologically, <laughs> manipulate the other person, meaning that you sometimes your ex is inv is engaging in all of this fighting because they, th they want to interact with you. Right, they want something. What do they yeah. want? Right, uh, and uh, or do they want an apology even though you don't need to apologize um you know if you just stick with the law and what's fair and what your friends and family are telling you that could drive things into the ground whereas if you just look at it from above and say okay i'm pretty sure my ex wants x y and z so how can i give that while preserving my own sanity and boundaries you know sometimes what it means is you gray rock your ex meaning that you only speak through your lawyers mm -hmm. and in very brief memos, <laughs> like two sentence memos, you you never respond to text, you never respond by phone. You know, I'm not saying that's the right way to go, but sometimes that's the way to psychologically deal with your ex, just figuring out like what's the pathway forward, not necessarily what's fair or sane, but 
what is going to get me from A to B <laughs> uh, is, is something to think about. Um, middle term patient, Teresa, she says, Hi, Dr. Kirk and Rebecca. Thank you so much for this podcast. I was wondering if you and Rebecca could discuss issues around pregnant therapists mm. and early motherhood. Pregnant therapists and early motherhood. For example, how do therapists handle the instability of care that mm -hmm. can come from being randomly nauseous mm -hmm. and, oh, care of the therapist giving mm -hmm. care to the client, you know, instability of their therapy to their clients that can come from being randomly nauseous. Well, let me just say, I know many people who vomited in front of their clients and it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she also mentioned sleep deprived. Uh, I'll chime in. And oh I'll, yeah. So I remember I, this story. My, my therapist, she fell asleep on you. She fell asleep in a session and I, I didn't, you know, <laughs> I was fine with it uh, uh, going on. How do you handle the attachment? Rep and, you know, the, the ethical or sound thing to do is to just tell your clients where you're at. Yeah. And, and I know. And prepare them, you know. And I know so many of my friends had to go back to work when their infants are like two or three weeks old. Just financially, they had to do it. Yeah. So, um, you know, the fact that you will have a pregnant therapist or a parent to a newborn who's also your therapist is high. Mm -hmm. uh, and But there's also big counter-transference issues too. I mean, sometimes clients who have their own issues with birth or pregnancy can get, you know, can bring it all up for them. They weren't able, or able to get pregnant or their pregnancy didn't go well or the birth of their child ended their marriage. Well, and also just the fact that as a therapist, it's... You can't hide it. Well, <laughs> and there's an implied care that you even have to the unborn, unborn child, mm -hmm. right? And that's a competitor to the attachment to the client, especially mm -hmm. if it's impacting therapy in some way. So, you know, that could happen as well. Um, you know, just preparing people. And then you ask, Teresa, how do you handle the attachment disruption that could happen from pausing treatment while on maternity leave? And what I would say is that, you know, typically clients will, they'll adjust. Uh, it might carry with it some pain and anxiety. And just, you know, make sure you have a covering therapist that is available if there are clients that need to have continuing care. But most clients, anecdotally, at least in my practice and my friends' practices that I know, they could handle a month off and, and not have it be a massive problem. And um, also there's an unpredictability of it. You know, you might plan to go out when you're nine and a half weeks pregnant and you might give birth at nine weeks, you mm -hmm. know, and you have to kind of prepare your clients for all of that and, and the expectations you might come back with not happy news too. I mean, I know yeah. people who've had stillbirths and then, you know, there's all this expectation with their clients of what happened and they need more time off. And, you know, I mean, everybody ad can adjust. Right. These are, these are natural forms of life and death. Yeah. I think that the message to therapists, particularly I think novice therapists is that you're allowed to be a human being mm -hmm. and you're allowed to, I guess, uh, ask that your clients adjust around you being a human being. <laughs> It'd be the same as if you had chronic fatigue or some other kind of issue that impacts your care of your clients. Of course, you know, consider everything and give clients options and take care of yourself and pay attention to clients. But, you know, like the sort of classic that I always think about is that we sit a lot as therapists <laughs> and it can be hard for some people to sit without stretching that for that amount of time, whether it be back pain or stiffness or energy, you know, at lack of energy or whatever, falling asleep. And what I always tell people is, you know, what I would tell my supervisees is stand the fuck up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, what would you want to do in a normal situation if you were talking to a friend? And they're like, well, I'd, I'd stand up and stretch. Well, then stand up and stretch. <laughs> Your clients aren't um, that fragile, right? right. Uh, and you're probably going to be a much better therapist. If Or an, another classic is if you have to go pee, just go pee in the mm -hmm. middle of a set, you know, not in the, in the office, but go to the bathroom. It's okay. Your client will be okay. You know, ask yourself, what if your therapist had back pain and wanted mm -hmm. to stand up? What if your therapist had to go to the bathroom in the middle of a session? Would it devastate you? You know, there's this, I don't know, this message that is given or is in the culture or something that as a therapist, 
you have to completely deny right, we everything. Have no needs. Yeah. Yeah. I think to err on the side that most clients, and there's a select amount of clients who cannot handle that, and that speaks to their issues. But, you know, most people would like you to be comfortable and present. Um, and having had a newborn and attempted to go back to my practice, I would also just say to this person, and maybe they've already experienced this, is uh, your child's early years will really impact who you are as a therapist. One, you are of a different mind. You know, your, ther- your work was probably your most important thing. After you have kids, there's no way to avoid that your work then comes second. Mm-hmm. And then little kids are sick all the time. And that will really impact your practice. And, and people who can handle that will understand that. But, you know, you might have to cancel more sessions because your kid is sick or you're mm-hmm. sick. Yeah. And it's all, about, it's all about informed consent. So you just prepare your clients for what's coming and ask if that's okay with them. If it's not, then maybe moving towards having another therapist is, is in the future. You are allowed to be human. There's a line and that's, you know, something to discuss with colleagues or supervisors that you can cross where you can make it too much about yourself. There's there's a line there, of course, and but there's nothing about being pregnant that is inherently going to create problems that you can't prepare for. Plus, you know, they're like with my therapist who fell asleep, it was temporary. And you knew in the moment there was nothing. It wasn't about you. Was- well, I can be boring in therapy, but <laughs> but that's that's not her fault you know (laughs) um but right i I did and i didn't take it personally um i i I just thought it was as a therapist myself i just thought oh my god yeah so like as a therapist i am the itchiest therapist like i am always squirming and itchy and this is actually where being an art therapist comes in really well because i'm always like getting up and getting art supplies or like rearranging stuff and you know, I'm a squirmy therapist. That's just who I am. And if you can't Me take, too. if you can't take someone who's moving around a lot, yeah. I'm probably, you know, you and you pick up on it real quick. So, you know, I'm probably not the right fit for you. Yeah, yeah, it's funny because you squirm when we podcast. I'm very squirmy, and no other really? person that I talk to squirms like you or me i squirm you notice i squirm a lot yeah, too well it just looks normal to me I'm, I'm like constantly moving around moving the microphone around this chair is the chair that i podcast and am a therapist in and it's perfect because i can sit indian style at like you're doing right now yeah, crisscross applesauce in this chair and it also has no wheels like a lot of office mm. chairs do because wheels when i squirm it's the Mm-hmm. You know, the chair starts moving around. I need to be solidly foundationed to the to the ground. Yeah. No, I am so squirmy. And yeah. I'm sure, and I've heard actually it's connected to kids who have processing, who process differently tend to be squirmy. So. Well, I think, yeah, I think it has something to do with neurology, but I also think it has something to do with knowing our needs. I, I imagine a lot of people want to squirm, but they're trying to be as still and as compliant as possible. Because there's so many messages to kids and also to adults that to squirm is to be immature or to be disrespectful or something. Well, and true story, this is how I my prefer way to sit at a restaurant, which means I'm at a restaurant, I wanna take my shoes off and I wanna cross my legs, which much to the embarrassment of my family. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, why are you taking your shoes off? I've talked about this before on the podcast, but I, I can't stand wearing shoes either. And as a therapist, and as a professor, as soon as I could take my shoes off, I would. <clears throat> so in advising meetings with students at the university in my office, uh, I was f- apparently infamous for um, not only taking my shoes off, but because of my squirminess. And squirminess, it's it's not just squirmy, it's trying to get comfortable. Yeah. And the one of the most comfortable positions I could get in was shoes off, feet on my desk. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um, now... My students would be to my right. Do you know what I mean? So my feet would be up on. I would. My feet would. The feet wouldn't be in the student's face mm-hmm. because the the desk was against the wall. So I was sitting with my feet. My body is perpendicular to the eye line of the student. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I, I just 
never apologized for it because what's the big deal? I'm, you know, if, if a student wanted to kick back and put their feet up on another chair, I'm, I'm all for that. Um, well, and I also draw constantly. So this, my excuse now is I'm an art therapist and I'll be drawing all the way through this meeting. Hmm. Um, but may, as a kid, I <laughs> didn't, have I told this story about, oh, what? what's the class you take in 10th grade for math? Geometry? Well, I was in advanced math, okay. so <laughs> Never there's, mind. there's trig. And... No, 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 it was just geometry. Okay. I was not in advanced math. So I would spend my geometry class, which was horrible, and I didn't understand what was happening, drawing on my desk. And then I loved that I would come back the next class and someone would have drawn even more on what I had drawn. Like, this to me was the greatest thing that ever happened. And the teacher got so mad. He shamed me in front of the entire class, moved me to the front of the room so I could no longer draw on the desk. It's not like I learned anything more <laughs> by doing that. I also told him someday I'm going to get paid to doodle, which he laughed in my face. And now I laugh back at him because I do get paid to doodle. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, now, I mean, now I look back in that story and I'm like, oh my God, I was trying to visually process something that I didn't understand at all. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so you were drawing the geometry on. The I was desk? just drawing. He's talking, and it's like he might have been, might as well have been telling like a fantasy tale that happened to have numbers in it. Like it made no sense to me whatsoever. And so I was drawing to soothe myself. I would love to see those drawings now. But then someone else would add to the drawing, and then that, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm in. Why didn't you doodle on a piece of paper? I don't know. Didn't cross my mind. We probably. He was the type of person that probably like handed out something that we were all working on and then we had to hand it back to him at the yeah. end of the class. Some kind uh, of I had a moment like that when I was like in the fifth grade, I had this drawing table of my dad's and it was a very important table to my dad, but I was given the ability to have it in my bedroom and I was absentmindedly picking at oh, the, the, the wood and slowly but surely after i don't know like 15 minutes i dug a really deep hole in the side of this wood ancient beloved drawing table and then all of a sudden i realized what i was doing and i was like what did i just do <laughs> like, oh no i don't think i got in trouble for it though do you ever do anything like that? Like you, you pick at something and all of a oh, sudden you I've, realize I've, oh I've, I've picked the paint off yeah, this no, windowsill I, I have there was an incident in the kitchen. We had like really old linoleum counters where the linoleum, like just like this table, the linoleum was on the side, but the linoleum was much, much older and it was coming up a little bit. And I just to test. For the record, this is not linoleum. No, but you know what I'm saying? Like it, because it, sometimes the counters, now everything's like fancy stone. Yeah. But these were like linoleum and then, yeah, yeah there was another strip it on the side. It was plywood and then they would glue linoleum yeah. on, the, on the top and the sides. And so I just wanted to see how much it was up and I just pulled a little bit and the whole strip came off. I was like, ugh. <laughs> well, That's what's funny, classic me. Well, what's funny about stuff like that when we're kids both. That was an adult when that happened. Oh, well, <laughs> both with my drawing desk and with that, there are solutions. Right. But at the time, like no one else does that, right? Like it's so horrific that I've like taken part of the kitchen apart, you know. But well, what happened after that? I mean, I had to explain to my wife what I had done. Oh, it was your own house. It was my own house. Oh, okay. Well, you know, there you go. Well, plus if something's that easily right. stripped off, that thing was gonna fall off eventually anyway because yeah. it's supposed to be pretty secure you right know? i mean that glue at that point is probably 50 years old so. right and excuse to update the <laughs> counters what did you do did you glue it back on i can't remember what we did but we replaced with white linoleum again that i didn't like you know Once. linoleum's making it having a comeback i know well the floors in that kitchen are 50s linoleum and everybody comes in and goes crazy for them they're like cream colored with the pink and the blue speckle mm -hmm. And people just go nuts. <laughs> you know, there was a long period of time where that was like completely out of date, but now it's circled back and it's right. amazing. So if you just hold onto your kitchen floors for 70 years, they'll circle back. That's how I feel about fashion. <laughs> I was wearing some, was it pants or something? And I have some younger friends and they were like, hey, that's pretty hip of you to wear, you know, those pants or those shoes or something. And I'm like, huh? Like, oh, yeah, you know, it's those are coming back in style. And I'm like, I'd never stopped wearing them. <laughs> I wore them when they were in style through decades of them not being in style. 
and now they're back in style. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a broken clock is right, right twice, twice a, day. a day. So a bad fashioned dad type is fashionable twice a century. Very good. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because... The holidays suck, so do what you can. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. Okay. So God damn it. So I I put it in my calendar to give you this package that a fan sent to you. Oh. I uh, you know put, right in front of you. I put the package I noticed it. And I'm not Snoopy. As you were leaving, you go, "Is that for me?" And I said, "That's my impression of you." <laughs> and uh, yes, it is. So Oh, oh here you go. Let me open it. A, a fan sent oh you something. God. And I don't know what it is. We have oh. Rebecca opening it up. It looks like it looks some, soft and squishy. So there's a, zip, a Ziploc bag. It's anthrax. Just joking. It, oh my god! <laughs> it, is, it is a quilted square that says "Happy Lamulka," and it's a llama with a menorah on its back. And uh, we'll take a photo right now. Thank you, listener, who didn't sign their name anywhere. Oh. It has a return address from Lorraine. Lorraine. Good old Lorraine from Fremont, California. Lorraine oh. it has been a long-time listener. Lorraine, this is so great. It's got, uh, so you can hang it. It's got like a curtain rod spot in the back. Yeah, it's like a little blanket oh my with God. a llama and a menorah. And, and it I says, was, Happy Lamaka. And I was just saying that it's Hanukkah tomorrow night, and I don't feel like I'm properly have enough to decorate, but I will put this proudly up in my window. Happy Lamulka, every day, everyone, especially to you, Lorraine. <laughs> so sweet. 